So you may not know much about this yet, but there is something in your exams for statistics called the large data set. And the large data set that we have um, is about weather in the UK and in some international stations that we have. So I've written here that all A-level exam boards are obligated to provide a large data set. In other words, like a big spreadsheet full of numbers. Data in exam questions will often be from this set, and you are encouraged to explore this data, which is publicly available in Microsoft Excel. So questions that we'll be doing throughout statistics will refer to this data, and we'll try and get a bit more of a sense about what the data actually means, what it represents. And I've said it's important to note that you're expected to be familiar with this data set before you go into your exam, including, and this is where people don't like this, some basic knowledge of geography. So you need to actually start to know a little bit more about what this data is, and not just about how to do stuff to it, but about what it actually means as well. So I've said here that Edexcel's data set concerns weather data from a number of weather stations, and we're going to explore what you might be expected to know. So I'm actually just going to open up the data in Excel here, and I'm just going to show you a little bit about it, and then I'll break it down um, a bit more. So I'll talk you through these maps in just a second. But what you get are some big tables with all different headings. There are the dates along the side, and you have some real information. This is real information that has been recorded um, about different temperatures, rainfall, blah, 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 all different things for particular months in some years that they have measured. And you'll see along the bottom that you've got it for different locations, and there's many, many different sheets as you go along. And they've even got some international destinations like Beijing, Jacksonville, and Perth as well. So we're going to, across the course, be engaging with some of these things. But for now, what we're going to do is try and familiarize ourselves with what is actually here. And you won't like this, but lots of this stuff you do actually need to know off by heart. So the first thing that you need to know about are the names and the rough locations of the five UK weather stations, as well as the three international weather stations. So first of all, let's have a look at some of these things, OK? We've got this place down here called Camborne, then Hearn. Heathrow is easy, because we know Heathrow is in London. Then we have Leeming and Luchars. Now, there's some interesting things to notice, and you should probably add this to your diagram, that Camborne, I would underline it. Maybe I'm going to underline it in like this kind of way. Camborne is on the coast. So there it is, some little wiggly lines there to say it's on the coast. Hearn is also on the coast, and Luchars is also on the coast. Now, how are we going to remember where these things go? Well, the way I remember this is going in this order, they are almost perfectly in alphabetical order. See, these are the wrong way around, but these are in alphabetical order. So the only two that are the wrong way around are Heathrow and Hearn, about being in alphabetical order. But we know that Heathrow isn't on the south coast, because it's obvious Heathrow is the, one of the main airports in the whole world. We know it's in London, or it's just outside of London. So Camborne, Hearn, Heathrow, Leeming, Luchars. That's how we need, to, we need to know where they are on a map. And then we've got some different international destinations. And you need to know a couple of things about this. Beijing, pretty obvious that Beijing is in China. Jacksonville, does anyone know where Jacksonville is? Florida. It is, it's in Florida. Jacksonville is in Florida. Now, I don't know if you know much about like Florida weather, but anyone got any ideas of what the weather's like in Florida from when you've seen stuff in movies and stuff? There's hurricanes, there's tornadoes. In the summer, it's often really hot. It can be stormy. OK, so it's quite like a hot, tropical place. And there's been lots and lots of hurricanes and tornadoes. So that's important to know about Jacksonville. And then we've also got, in the southern hemisphere, we've got Perth, which is in Australia. And the difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere is, right now, we are experiencing our winter because it's December for us. But in the Southern Hemisphere, it's their summer. So right now, I don't know if you've ever seen people celebrating like Christmas on the beach in Australia. We're often inside freezing cold at Christmas time. 
but in Australia, they're having summer and they will have barbecues on the beach. So this is important. Sure, sure. Yeah. Correct, yeah. When we're having our summer, they're having their winter. The thing is, their winter, oh, their winter doesn't get as bad as our winter. But in generally, it will be cold in Australia in, the summer, in our summertime, and it will be their winter. So that's also important to know, because you might have to try and guess which of these international destinations the data that they've given you is. You might do some data crunching, and you might come across something, and you might think, oh, it's Perth, because the other countries are all warm. And I think that Perth is probably going to be cold when the other countries are warm. So you've got that difference between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. Yes? The Northern Jacksonville. Yeah. Do you need to know the controls or just the US? The US is fine for Jacksonville because there's only... So we've got one in the US, one in Asia, in China, and one in oh, Australia. Yeah. Okay? But Jacksonville is in Florida. And I, I guess the reason I want to remember it's in Florida is because I know that Florida is... I think of places like Miami. I think of like... Disneyland, all places that make me think of it being hot and sunny, and Florida also makes me think of hurricanes and stuff like that. So that sometimes can give you a clue about which place they might be talking about, okay? So these go in alphabetical order, apart from Heathrow and Hearn, which are switched. That's fine, because we know that Heathrow is in London. And the data that we have access to is only for six months, May, June, July, August, September, October, for six months between May and October in 1987, and the same six months, but in 2015. So what they often like to do is to get you to compare how the weather has changed between 1987 and 2015. And we'll break that down a little bit more in just a second, okay? So you need to be familiar with the variables involved and their respective units. Now, this isn't something you're going to be able to just digest all at once, but this is something we'll be using in questions throughout um, statistics. So I'm going to start at the top bit that we've got here. So all the following are measured daily. So they'll have measurements down the side of what day things are being are done here. The first thing you'll get told about is the total rainfall. And the rainfall is measured in millimetres. They literally get like a, a jug and they put it outside and they see how much rain fills up and they measure how high it's gone in millimetres. Okay? But I've written something here. When it says TR forward slash trace, just TR or trace, it means that there is less than 0.05 millimetres that has been rained. 0.05 millimetres is barely any rain at all. It's not really rain. So if you ever come across the table and it says TR in the rainfall, you're allowed to use zero in the calculation. A trace of rain means it was basically not even raining at all. Let's just pretend it's zero. We also need to know a bit about the mean or the average wind speed. When you see the letters KN, it stands for knot. And a knot is a nautical mile per hour. Okay, so it's the nautical miles per hour. One knot is 1.15 miles per hour. And the wind speed is also given on the Beaufort scale. The Beaufort scale says that if it's less than one knot, it's a zero when it's calm. One to 10 knots is light wind. 11 to 16 knots is four, which is moderate and 17 to 21 knots is called fresh. Now, I haven't seen many questions where they've asked you to use this conversion, and I haven't seen many questions where they've asked you to do anything with this, but it's just worth knowing this is the kind of thing that you could be expected to have a look at. So we told you, you need to know all of this. You will need to know all of this, yeah, and I've got a sheet that's gonna help you to memorize some of these things as well, but for now, it's just sure? like getting familiar with it. So you have to all the no, 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 you don't have to memorize all the values. You have to memorize like, what kinds of things you have to memorize for example that like in rainfall trace means zero you have to kind of think about how you would use it and you have to think about like i don't know if if it's got like a small wind speed we know it's not very windy i mean it's common sense kinds of things but i just want to point out like the stuff that might come up then they've also got something called the mean visibility this is how far in meters can be seen into the horizon during daylight hours so if you can see far it means that it's not very cloudy or it's not very foggy, so you can see for quite a distance. And then these four columns that we've got at the end are all talking about different wind directions, which are either to do with bearings or to do with the compass. We've then got a little section here, which is to do with the pressure, which is to do with air pressure. And this is measured in something called hectopascals. 
So you just need to be familiar with that unit. I'm not expecting you to go outside and like measure air pressure or anything. And I'm just gonna come back over to this side. You then get told about the mean temperature. So you get told the average temperature in degrees centigrade. You get told the total sunshine, which is measured to the nearest tenth of an hour. So it's how much sunshine there is in a day. The maximum gust in knots is not like the mean wind speed. It's the highest instantaneous wind speed. So they're not looking at an average wind speed. They just want to know how strong was one gust of wind on that day. The humidity, this is the percentage of the air saturation with water vapor. So the most humidity that you can have is 100%. That is the maximum percentage of water content that the air can contain. Have you ever been to like a foreign country where it feels really sweaty and hot outside? That's because in Bangladesh, the, in the summer especially, it's going to be hot and humid and sticky. That's what 100% humidity is. If you go to somewhere that's like a desert country, the humidity will be like 0% and it will be really hot but it won't feel sweaty in quite the same way. So that's what humidity means. Now this last one, they have had an exam question on this, okay? And the exam question was to do with the cloud cover and cloud cover is measured in octas. Octas, when you hear the word octa, you think of like octopus, octagon, and it is to do with that. Cloud cover says that octas means the number of eighths of the sky that is covered. And so the way that they, you can actually do this is you take like a piece of card with eight like sections cut out of it. You try and cover the sky with the card with the eight holes in it. And you try and see how much of the sky as a fraction is covered. That is actually how meteorologists will talk about how cloudy something is. Okay. They do. Yeah. 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 How do they actually, because like, can't you like do different perspectives and look at different sizes? So you know like, you know on your iPhone cameras, you know the fish eye lens that they have on cameras? Do you know what I mean? The fish eye lens where it kind of looks like you see the whole room like all at once? Yeah. Yeah, so they do get these cameras now that can take a picture of the entire sky and they will then split the sky up into eight bits and try and see how much of the sky is covered. But if you want to do it in like a... A, like a homemade version, you try and like cover the sky with a piece of paper with eight holes in it and you see how many of the holes are covered up. So the scale for the octaves, you can have zero octaves all the way up to eight octaves, which means there's no blue sky at all. So the scale is between zero and eight. Even though it sounds like it's going to be out of eight, it's actually out of nine because you've got the zero in there as well. So that's what we mean by all of the different things that you will be, uh, need to be familiar with. The third thing, and I'm not going to read through all of these, but you should have a vague idea of the range of values for each location. So this will be clearer when we actually do some kinds of um, exercises and stuff in the future. But generally, you can see that like as you go further north, because remember this is going like further north here, the temperature range like decreases. So you can see it's getting slightly cooler from Heathrow to Hearn to Leeming to Luchars. And that makes sense because as you go up north to Scotland, it's going to be getting cooler because you're going further away from the equator. And you can also see it's quite windy up in Luchars as well. And that's because it's on the coast. Usually coastal places are probably going to be a bit windier, but there's going to be some variation with that as well. Um, so the mean wind speed in the UK across a full period was roughly nine... Uh, what's the nautical miles, but four nautical miles in Beijing, five in Jacksonville, and eight in Perth. So basically it's less windy in Beijing and it's less windy in Jacksonville, which is unexpected because of things like hurricanes. Then for the world locations, this is all for 2015, the Beijing temperature range is pretty large. It's pretty, um, it's pretty hot in Beijing and it goes also quite cold as well. The minimum Jacksonville temperature is high. That's kind of what we expected. We said that Florida was like a hot kind of place. And Perth also goes down quite low. That's because Perth is further away from the equator and Beijing is further away from the equator. Jacksonville, if you look back at the map, is actually quite closer. It's quite close to the equator, so it gets that kind of tropical kind of weather that we've got. Okay, the last thing is you need to have a vague idea of the range of values for each variable for the data set as a whole. So the typical values for gust, you'd expect it between zero and 52 nautical miles. The rainfall is between zero and 60 millimeters in the UK. 
but you do get some more extreme maximums elsewhere. So in Perth, you can maybe have some really rainy times. Again, this is usually going to be built up in the question, okay? This isn't something I'm going to expect you to have these numbers stored in your head, but it's just having like a rough idea. Pressure is usually around 1,000 hectopascals. Um, the maximum is fresh, but it's mostly light or moderate. You normally get zero to 16 hours of sunshine in a day, and you only go between zero and eight octaves. Octaves is like fully covered with cloud. So it's just for a rough idea of how, how many hours of things, how many cloud cover stuff that you might have, okay? And I've also got here a summary of some things with this large data set. We will be exploring loads of these things in the large data set. Um, we'll be exploring them with actual data when we get to that stage. But for now, I just wanted to give us some of the information. So we've got the overseas locations, we've got the UK locations, we've got the times that they are, and we've got some things to do with the seasons. Well, we know that May and June is the end, May to, May and June is the end of spring, July, and September, July to September is the summer, October is the autumn. When you think about what weathers are associated with that time, we obviously know it's hot in the summer, windy in autumn. And obviously, for Perth, we said it's Australia, you've got the flipping around of the seasons. This is something that we will come across when we do some of our um, data analysis, but on, in the 15th to the 16th of October in 1987, there was the great storm in the UK where there was gusts of up to 100 knots recorded. So it was really, really windy on the night of the great storm in October 1987. That's worth remembering. Andrew? So why did the wind do great storm? Because the, because the average is across six months, so... It's about 180 days. Yeah, but that's in effect the range of it. Oh, so the range when we talked about here, because this is these are gusts rather than oh, the mean wind speed. So the gust, oh, okay. you could have quite a strong gust because that's like an individual event. In, in Florida, there are hurricanes. So in both Octobers, there was Hurricane Floyd and then Hurricane um, Hakuin. Oh, I don't know how you say that. Yeah. And then for the different variables, these are all the things we've talked about so far, so I'm not going to go through all of those individually, but it's just kind of having it nice all on one page. This is really important to notice. If it says NA, it means it's not available. So you can't use that particular reading from the Edexcel spreadsheet if it says not available. Maybe there was a problem with the machine that day when it was recorded. If it says TR, that's trace, that means you can actually just say that it's equal to zero in your calculations. And then I've got some other bits here about what the directions look like on a compass, what the Beaufort scale is, and a reminder about what the octaves are. Okay, so I will also include um, a link to this PDF that was from somewhere I found online. From PXN Maths, I think. Um, and I'll include that PDF for you guys so that you can use that for parts of revision. And what we're going to do is we're going to start using this in a couple of examples.